In this video, we're going to talk about why are spreads wider in some stocks and some Forex pairs compared to others. Stay tuned. Hey traders, a very warm welcome to you. Okay, so why do we have spreads that are really, really tight in some things, but really wide in others? What's the reason behind it? Who's causing this? Why is it like this? How can we change it? Should we be bothered? Let's have a look. So if we're looking at currency pairs, for example, big old pairs like Euro, US dollar, US dollar, JPY, GBP, USD, anything big like that, spreads are really, really tight. Same if we look at stocks, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, um, any of these big stocks, we could go on and on and on forever, couldn't we? Some of the UK stocks like Vodafone, BP, what have you. Very, very tight spreads. Whereas we look at other pairs, some of the exotic pairs out there, some of the less uh, well-known companies, the spreads are wide. You know, we have spreads of kind of one pip, you know, less than one pip for some stuff, going up to maybe 20 pips for uh, some of the currency pairs. And the same with, with stocks. So what, what's causing this? If we look at the, the biggest reason is liquidity. The more people we have got involved in a market, the tighter the spread. And it goes without saying, really. You know, Euro, US dollar, for example, a spread is formed when we've got buyers and sellers looking to buy, looking to sell. The more people that we have, the more likely they're going to be close to an agreement, the tighter the spread is going to be. So the more volume coming in as well as we're talking about, the more volume flow flowing in and the more participants that actively want to buy and sell that product, the tighter the spread is going to be purely because of the way the spread works. You know, we have and in the underlying market, we have a situation where, you know, we've got one buyer uh, down here at, you know, 100 and we've got a, a sort of seller here at 102 and the spread can narrow, narrow right down. The more people we've got in, the more chance we've got of someone coming in here at 101, the more chance we've got someone coming here at 101 and 1.5. If the exchange allows this kind of uh, going down into tents, the more chance we've got someone then of coming in at 100.9. You get the idea. The point is, the more people that there are coming into the market, the more likely there are to be aggressive buyers and aggressive sellers looking to bid and offer the highest possible price and narrowing the spread right down, which is why on those big currency pairs, the spread is so, so tight because it's so, so tight in the underlying market. And then we go to a dealer, he doesn't have to put much of a markup on it. He can put a small markup on it because he knows himself also. He's got a lot of guys trading euro, a lot of guys trading yen, and he's going to make some volume on it. However, when we're talking about some uh, less liquid shares or some less liquid stocks or some less liquid currency pairs, we don't have a lot of participants. So let's say we have a small mining company, whatever it may be, and we'll call him Small Mine Inc. Okay, and he may be listed on the stock exchange or that company may be listed on the stock exchange, she, he, it. And we have a price here of 70 75. That might be the bid ask spread purely because no many, not many people trade it. Liquidity is low. Not many participants are interested in trading this. And so we haven't got someone else, someone else, someone else coming in and saying, okay, well, actually, you know, I'll pay 71, I'll pay 72. Or someone saying, saying, actually, I'll 74, 73, causing the spread to tighten. So you, you have this scenario where these people are like, I'm not that enthusiastic about it, but if I can get it for 70p or 70 cents, 70 dollars, whatever it is, I'll take it. The same with the sellers. There's not that liquidity, less people around, and also the volume. You know, if there's not enough volume coming through, it's a very low volume stock, a very low volume currency pair, you're going to have the same effect purely because it's going to take them longer to accumulate stuff. There's not, they can't just go and start chomping away at this offer. They're gonna have to work orders a bit better, gonna have to be you know, kind of compensated for doing that by giving the widespread. It, it just, you never get the narrowing down. So this part, we can kind of look at this now. Number three, which is the dealer risk in FX. If this happened to be, you know, some exotic currency pair, um, then there is a risk to the dealer. Because the dealer, yeah, goes to the interbank and the spread might be, you know, wide there, but he's got to pass that risk on to us as traders. We're trading through a, you know, a broker, spread bank, CFD, whatever, a dealer, spot, however we decide to trade it. We're going to get a wide spread as well, purely because of exactly the same reason it's wide in the underlying market. The dealer doesn't have that two-way flow, the volume of participants, the liquidity to allow them to tighten up the spread. Uh, you know, if there's a lot of people trading it, then you can tighten up the spread and make it more appealing. And, you know, as you can offset his buy and sell orders and make himself a bit more neutral. When there's not much spread, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of chicken and egg almost. When you've got a spread that's quite wide, should I say, not a lot of people get involved in it because of the widespread. 
and then the those that do get involved in it are paying a widespread and they don't want to get involved in it because of widespread. You get the point. The point is he can't offset the risk as much. So he's going to have to go into the underlying market and offset that risk, which is why, you know, we get some ridiculously widespreads on some on some exotics. The same with some of the, you know, the comp uh, the um, smaller companies. Spreads are wide because of that. And we look at the convert to cash ability. If you're a market maker or if you're um, you know, making a decision, even if you're just making a decision about buying or selling the stock, you want to know you can get out in and out quickly. Like if you buy some Apple shares, you can get out of them in an instant. Unless you're trading ridiculous size, Apple will soak up pretty much all you can throw at it. So the conversion to cash is quite easy. So there's less of a decision process to make. You don't have to say, don't think about it much. If you like this chair and you want to buy it, you'll buy it. Whereas if you're looking at Mr. Small Mine Inc. or the company Small Mine Inc., you're going to think a little bit harder about that. And again, this is this chicken and egg scenario where, uh, you know, if I buy it at 75, I'm already down by $5. You know, do I want to invest in this company? Is it really worth my while? And so, you know, you, you, you don't get the liquidity, you don't get the volume coming in, you don't get the spread narrowing up, which is why we kind of have market makers for a lot of stocks, especially in the UK and the US. You've got companies that are purely engaged in making a market because otherwise, as we see, the cycle will just get too big. You'd have situations where, you know, you'd be looking at kind of 50 to 100 or something because nobody wants to buy, nobody wants to sell. And there are loads and loads of companies out there that daily do very little volume. Very few people want to buy and sell that company. And if they didn't have someone to buy and sell to a market maker, they wouldn't be able to participate. You can't ultimately you can't always rely on you know new market neutral participants getting involved and exchanging together and providing that exchange you've got to provide you know a service to them a liquidity service which is where the market makers come in and have some form of minimum spread so even though it's it's wide it's not completely excessive i have been trading markets before uh in down markets heavy down markets trading on the sets uh at london stock exchange order book and I've seen situations where you'd have been so aggressive selling that the order book has just gone almost completely empty and you've had kind of one or two orders that are way down from the price. Say the price is 100, you've got someone left in there at 20 and at 10. And of course, uh, if someone does hit a sell into that, it triggers a circuit breaker. So it doesn't actually, you know, you don't get that scenario. But th that's the point when you've got fast moving markets and in one direction and the lack of liquidity, then spreads can widen also. Uh, so it's not just, you know, uh, not just normal market conditions we get this. We also rely, you know, we also look at the lack of liquidity in fast market conditions, which is why, guys, you know, we're trading with a dealer or a broker, they'll often widen the spread because the spreads are going to be widening the underlying because it's so quick and people are, you know, there, there isn't that liquidity based on the volume. The volume is so high and the, the speed is so high and the range is so high, liquidity is not matching up to it, which is why we get these extreme moves. So that's a little bit of a, a, an introduction into why spreads are wider in some stocks and forex pairs from a trading perspective unless we've got a real reason to start trading stuff with widespread as a, as a kind of you know a, a, an intraday trader or a swing trader or an active trader we're better off there's enough stocks and, and currency pairs out there to stick with the ones that have got a reasonable spread for us so we're not losing money every time we take a trade if we're investing different ball game but as an active trader let's keep it on the tight spreads all right guys see you next one take care get your risk managed goodbye